was of Dutch descent, and therefore I only spoke Dutch until I was nine years old. My given name was Illabella Bonfri. By the time I was nine years old, I was sold at auction with a flock of sheep for $100. I was then sold three more times in four years and severely beaten because I did not speak English. I eventually got married and had five children. My current master promised me freedom in 1826, right before the 1827 New York Emancipation. When he reneged on his promise, I simply walked away with my newborn baby. I stayed with a Christian couple named Van Wagner and became a devout Christian and began to preach. And when I, when I found out that my five-year-old son had been sold to an Alabama slave owner, with the help of the Van Wagners, I took that white slave owner to court and got my son back. One of the first black women to do so in the United States. On June 1st, 1843, I changed my name to Sojourner True and told my friends, the spirit calls me and I must go. I became an evangelist and traveled and preached about the abolition, abolition of slavery. In 1850, I dictated my memoirs to Lloyd Garrison and he published my book. I was able to buy a house that very first year from the proceeds from my book for $300. That year, I spoke at the National Women's Rights Convention. In 1851, I spoke on the lecture circuit in Central and Upstate New York, speaking out for women's rights. My most famous speech was, Ain't I a Woman? I spoke to hundreds of audience on women's rights over the next 10 years. I worked with Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists. In 1863, I met President Lincoln. In 1865, I went back to Washington to secure land grants for freed slaves. I was unsuccessful even though I worked for seven years years. In 1872, I tried to vote in the presidential election, but was unsuccessful. Turned away at the polling place for my race. 
For the remainder of my life, I spoke about abolition, women's rights, prison reform, and preached to the Michigan legislature against capital punishment. I conducted my last interview just days before I died. I was 86 years old and never stopped until I closed my eyes for good. It's my responsibility to introduce to you one of the greatest women that ever lived, and her name was Harriet Putnam. She was born during the early 1820s on a plantation owned by a man named Anthony Thompson in Madison, Maryland. Her name, Aretha Meta, was given by her parents, Harriet and Ben Ross. Aretha Meta had a tremendously hard and difficult childhood. At the age of six or seven, she was given the responsibility to take care of the plantation owner's children. This was a cruel task. For you see, if one of the babies cried, she was beaten and punched. Even at this young age, she despised, <coughs> resented, and resisted her life as a slave. On many occasions, she tried to run away. Once she was gone for up to five days, only to be caught and returned. One day, she was sent to a store for supplies. While there, she saw a runaway slave who was trying to be detained by the slave overseer. The overseer demanded that Araminta help him restrain the slave. She refused. This gave the slave a chance to run away. The overseer threw a heavy beam at the slave, which missed him and hit her in the head. Araminta's skull was cracked open. The damage from this injury caused her lifelong ramifications. She began to have seizures and fainting spells. There were times when she didn't know who she was or where she was. It was during this time and this season that she developed a deep relationship with God. In 1844, she married a free man named John Tuckman. He was free, but she wasn't. It was about that time that she decided to do two things, change her name to Harriet and escape from slavery. When her husband tried to discourage her because he was fearful for her life, she told him there was one of two things I have a right to, liberty or death. If I can't have one, I would surely have another. Yeah. <laughs> On September 17, 1849, Harriet and her two brothers escaped from slavery because they had been hired out to another plantation owner it took a while for it to be discovered that they were missing. Uh, the brothers returned for various reasons, but Harriet was bound for the promised land. She used a network known as the Underground Railroad to reach her destination. This well-organized system was uh, composed of free and enslaved blacks, white abolitionists, religious groups, and uh, other activists most prominent of this group, they were called Quakers. It was believed that this group was the one that helped her when she first, uh, on her first trip. The exact route she took is not known, but her 90 mile journey by foot from Maryland through Delaware, then north to Pennsylvania, uh, would take her up to three weeks. She had to travel by night to avoid the slave catchers eager to collect rewards for fugitive slaves. After reaching Philadelphia, uh, Harriet began to miss her family. A few months later, she arranged the escape of some of her family members and she met them in Baltimore and brought them to Philadelphia. The next spring, she began the first of many trips to Maryland to help guide other family members and anybody who wanted to be free. With each trip, she became more confident. 
For 11 years, Harriet, AKA Moses, personally led 13 expeditions and rescued 70 slaves to freedom. She also provided instructions to 60 other fugitives who escaped to the North. Her journeys into the land of slavery was dangerous work and put her at tremendous risk. She carried a revolver and was not afraid to use it. It was reported that on one of her expeditions, a man insisted he was going back. Harriet pointed the gun at his head and said, you ain't going nowhere, and you ain't going back. She pointed the gun at him and refused to let him go back. Needless to say, days later he was happy when they entered into the United Province of Canada. Yeah. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, mm -hmm. Harriet saw a Union victory. As a key toward the step of abolition for slavery, she worked and served closely as a nurse, caring for the wounded and suffering soldiers. After the 1863 uh, emancipation of slaves, she began to lead scouts through the land that she had become so familiar with. Later that year, Harriet became the first woman to lead an armed assault during the Civil War. She was a bad one. In her later years, Sister Tutman worked to promote the cause of women's rights. Asked by a white woman one time whether she believed women ought to vote, Sister Tutman replied, I suffered enough to get that right. She spent her remaining years tending to her family and others in need. By 1911, her body was failing. Uh, in 1913, surrounded by friends and family, she died of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Just before she died, she told them, I go to prepare a place for you. Yes. Harriet Tuckman was an African-American, mm -hmm. uh, was an abolitionist, a, a humanitarian, and a union spy. She was widely known and well respected. Uh, she became an American icon. She was named as one of the most famous civilians in American history. She inspired generations of African Americans struggling for equality and civil rights. May her legacy continue on. I was born Sarah Breedlove on December the 23rd 1867. I was an American entrepreneur and philanthropist. <laughs> Regarded as the first female self-made millionaire in America. I made my fortune by developing and marketing a successful line of beauty and hair products for black women under the company I found. Like many women of my era, I experienced scalp disorder and lost a lot of hair primarily because of poor diet, hygiene practices, and harsh products like lye that were included in soaps used to clean the hair. Because most Americans lacked indoor plumbing at that time, central heating and electricity, we bathed and washed our hair infrequently. Initially, I learned about hair care products from my brothers who owned a barbershop in St. Louis. I began to teach and train other black women in women's independence, budgeting, and grooming in order to help them build their own businesses. I also gave lectures on political, economic, and social issues at conventions sponsored by powerful black institutions. In 1917, I started the Walker Hair Culturist Union of America. I ended up being the first national meeting of American women brought together to discuss businesses and commerce. I got involved in political matters, joining the executive committee of the silent protest parade. It was a public demonstration for more than 8,000 African Americans to protest a riot that killed 39 African Americans. Just before my death, I pledged $5,000, which was equivalent to about 65,000 in today's dollars, to the NAACP, anti-lynching fund. It was called the Madam C.J. Walker. 
I passed at the Villa Lawaro on Sunday, May 25th in 1919 from complications from hypertension. I was 51 years old. I and my will was directed two thirds of future net profits of my estate to charity and bequeath. At my death, I was considered to be the wealthiest African American woman in America. According to my New York, according to the New York Times, my obituary stated that I myself was two years ago in 1917 that I was not yet a millionaire, but hoped to be one soon. My daughter Leela Walker became the president of the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company after the fact. I am Madam C.J. Walker. Amen. 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 It's an honor and a privilege to stand before you today to give some acknowledgement to a people that have paved the way for us. I stand before you today to represent the life and the legacy of Minister Thomas A. Dorsey. Amen. Most observers believe that gospel music has been sung in African American churches since their organization in the late 1800s. Nothing could be further from the truth as Michael Harris's history of gospel blues revealed. Tracing the rise of gospel blues as seen through the career of its founding figure, Thomas Andrew Dorsey, Harris not only tells the story of the most prominent person in the advent of gospel blues, but also contextualizes this powerful new musical form within African American religious history and significant social development. Thomas A. Dorsey, also known as Georgia Tom, had considerable success in the 1920s as a pianist, composer, and arranger for prominent blues singers, including Ma Rainey. In the 1930s, Dorsey became involved in Chicago's African-American Old Line Protestant churches, where his background in the blues greatly influenced his composing and singing. At first, these respectable Chicago churches rejected this new form, partially because of the unseemly reputation blues performance had, but more because of the excitement that gospel blues produced in the church congregation. Now, some of you younger folk may not know, but a lot of you seasoned folks do what gospel blues is. Just a little example. Well, they tell me that the eagle flies on Friday, Saturday, I go out to play. I'm talking about that eagle flies on Friday, Saturday, I go out to play. Sunday morning, I go to church, kneel down on my knees and cry. Lord, have mercy on your child. See, that music right there got the church going and it got the people involved, but they was like, uh-uh, that's not gospel, brother. We got to bring it back. So a controversy developed between two conflicting visions of the role of the church in African-American society. One segment envisioned an institution that nurtured a distinct African-American religion and culture. The other saw the church as a means by which African Americans would assimilate first into mainline African, I mean American community, I mean Christianity, and its sharply contrasting worship demeanor, and second into the dominant Anglo-American culture. However, by the end of the 1930s, the former group had prevailed. Because of the overwhelming response of the, of the congregation of gospel blues, that from that time on, it became a major force in African-American churches and religion. The rise of gospel blues expresses the border, cultural and religious histories of the African-American experience between the late 1890s and the late 1930s. And it takes us into our lesson of my character, the late minister Thomas Andrew Dorsey. Thomas Dorsey learned his religion from his Baptist minister father and piano from his music teacher Villa, in Villarica, Georgia, where he was born July 1st, 1899. He came under the influence of local blues pianists when they moved to Atlanta in 1910. He and his family relocated to Chicago during World War I, where they joined the Pilgrim Baptist Church and he studied at the Chicago College of Composition and arranging and became an agent for Paramount Records. 
He began his musical career known as Georgia Tom, playing barrel house piano in one of Al Capone's Chicago speakeasies and leading Ma Rainey's jazz band. He hooked up with slide guitarist Hudson Temple Red Whitaker, with whom he recorded the best-selling blues hit, Tight, like that, in 1928, and wrote more than 460 rhythm and blues and jazz songs. He was so whipped into shape to do the Lord's will. Discouraged by his own efforts to publish song sheets and dissatisfied with the treatment given composers of race music back in the music publishing industry, Dorsey became the first independent publisher of black gospel music. With the establishment of the Dorsey House of Music in Chicago in 1932, he founded and became the president of the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses. He wrote his classic and most famous song, Precious Lord. In the grief following the death of his wife in childbirth in 1932, it since has been recorded by such diverse artists as Mahalia Jackson, Tennessee Ernie Ford, Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, and Elvis Presley. And with the favorite gospel song of both Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who had asked that it be sung at the rally he led the night before his assassination, and the president, President Lyndon B. Johnson, who requested that it be sung at his funeral. Almost equally well known is his piece in the valley, which he wrote for Mahalia Jackson in 1937. In October of 1979, he was the first black elected to the, National, to the Nashville Songwriters International Hall of Fame. In 1981, his native Georgia honored him with election to the Georgia Music Hall of Fame. In March 1982, he was the first black elected to the Gospel Music Association's Living Hall of Fame. In August 1982, the Thomas A. Dorsey Archives were opened at Fisk University, where his collection joined those of W.C. Handy, George Gershwin, and the Jubilee Singers. Thus summing up his life, he says, all his work has been from God, for God, and for his people. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, and let me share. I, I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Yeah. 